once again, and welcome to what I'm going to call a mini module. Uh, so really what I want to do here is uh, something a little different than uh, what we've been doing in the previous modules up to this point. I really want to just uh, focus in and look at a very specific um, issue uh, and use it as an opportunity for us to uh, apply some of the Catholic social teaching principles that we've been working on uh, over the past few weeks. Uh, and really, again, focus in on, on one particular question. Uh, and so really, uh, what I thought would be an interesting uh, test case for this sort of an approach uh, is to look at uh, probably the public policy issue that has generated uh, more controversy, particularly in the Catholic world, uh, than really anything else uh, in recent memory. And that would be uh, looking at uh, the Affordable Care Act, popularly known as Obamacare, uh, from the perspective of Catholic social teaching. Uh, and obviously, I don't need to probably tell most of you uh, that the Affordable Care Act has generated a great deal uh, of controversy uh, in America in general, but in particular uh, in American Catholic circles. Um, and so I wanted to um, use this as an opportunity for us to, to look at this and to give you sort of my initial take on it from a Catholic social teaching perspective. Uh, and then, of course, have some opportunity for you all to spend some time uh, discussing and debating this and bringing uh, other considerations into the discussion. So, so that's going to be our focus here. We're going to look at the Affordable Care Act through the lens of Catholic social teaching and Catholic ethics uh, more generally. Uh, and so, uh, again, there's a huge body of literature on this out there. Uh, so what I'm going to give to you on Blackboard uh, are just a few documents uh, put out by the USCCB uh, and of course you are certainly encouraged and welcome to do uh, some broader digging uh, on the Affordable Care Act and Catholic responses to it uh, on your own. But I really want to keep my kind of input uh, fairly restrained and really use this just as a sort of test case to think through the principles uh, and not so much kind of comprehensive research on the details of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, if for no other reason, because uh, if we were to do or attempt a really comprehensive, detailed approach, um, regardless of when I recorded this, it would become obsolete uh, pretty quickly because uh, like most government policies, uh, it is constantly being debated and reformed as time goes on. So I really want to just consider sort of the big issues. So to try to talk about the Affordable Care Act from the perspective of Catholic social teaching, um, how can we break that down? Well, here's my kind of initial thoughts on how we might do that. And that would be to divide it into um, sort of pros, uh, cons, and then uh, aspects that are ambiguous or questionable. Uh, and again, uh, feel free to uh, make your own comments on how you would approach this, but um, seems like a reasonable way of looking at things uh, from my perspective. Uh, so. What would we say about the Affordable Care Act? Well, um, obviously, uh, we need to at least have some sense of what we're talking about here, right? So probably most of us are familiar with it, but this is a significant health care reform that is aimed primarily at increasing access to health care, uh, and in particular, increasing access to uh, sort of uh, regular uh, health care, that is preventative health care, uh, because prior to the... Uh, passing of the Affordable Care Act, uh, anyone could walk into an emergency room uh, and receive care whether or not they were covered by insurance. Um, so that has always been a possibility for people, but uh, the aim of this Affordable Care Act is to make it possible for people to not just walk into an emergency room, but really to walk into a doctor's office uh, or a clinic uh, and receive regular preventative care. Um, now, of course, to make that a possibility for most people, they're going to need uh, health insurance because uh, the way our uh, medical system is structured, uh, very few people uh, are gonna pay for it out of pocket. And uh, again, given the basic structure, very few people would be able to pay for it out of pocket. Uh, so uh, really health insurance uh, is a requirement for people to make regular access uh, of the healthcare system. So the aim of the Affordable Care Act is to uh, essentially expand uh, health insurance coverage, right? To uh, decrease the number of people 
who are not covered by any sort of health insurance policy. Uh, and so it attempts to do that uh, in several overlapping ways, right? One is to require people uh, to have health insurance, right? And so for those who uh, are able to um, access employee plans, uh, they will need to do that, or they will need to purchase health insurance uh, on the open market. Uh, and so there would be penalties for those who choose not to get health insurance, uh, right? And of course, the logic behind that is uh, to push more people into the system, uh, which will then sort of diffuse the costs uh, of expensive care among a broader uh, range of people, right? Because if only a, a select few people are, are getting health insurance, uh, it's going to be relatively more expensive for them to cover uh, serious conditions. Whereas if everybody is in uh, health insurance, then the costs get spread over uh, a larger group. Um, so that's one way this works, right? And of course, the other way is to uh, provide uh, these marketplaces where people who don't have access to an employee health plan uh, are able to uh, purchase health insurance through these uh, marketplaces. Um, and then along with that, uh, there are rules about requiring insurers to offer coverage to everyone uh, in these marketplaces. And then also, um, supplements or subsidies given to people um, who meet certain income uh, requirements uh, so that they are able to afford to purchase insurance on those uh, open marketplaces. Uh, and so again, the details of this aren't terribly relevant, but we need to understand the basic idea here is to increase health insurance coverage uh, so that people can receive regular preventative uh, care and hopefully lead healthier lives and also hopefully avoid uh, the sort of crisis situations that would lead people to the ER uh, under the previous system. So that's really the plan, right? Well, what are the, the real pros? What are the real benefits of this plan from the perspective of, of Catholic social teaching? Well, if you look at really any of the statements that come out uh, from the U.S. Catholic bishops uh, in connection with health care reform or the Affordable Care Act, uh, they pretty much all start with um, an affirmation of the idea that health care uh, ought to be a basic right, right? That we ought to be providing uh, health care to everyone uh, and that this is uh, a consequence of and a reflection of uh, the belief in the human dignity and value of every person. And so again, kind of the fundamental idea of Catholic ethics uh, at the roots of natural law and by extension at the roots of, of Catholic social teaching is this belief in the intrinsic dignity of every person regardless of uh, anything they might do, regardless of any of their abilities, regardless of uh, their particular health status, age, any of those things. Everyone has uh, this intrinsic dignity and value that must be respected. Um, and it's basically taken as a given uh, in these different documents uh, that you can look at that um, an obvious consequence of respecting a person's dignity uh, is providing them uh, with health care, right? That this is uh, basically understood to be along the lines of ensuring, um, you know, basic food and shelter for people. Um, so that even those who are desperately poor uh, and even those who have made poor choices uh, ought to uh, be given food and shelter and also, uh, the bishops would say, uh, health care. And that we do this out of recognition of that intrinsic uh, dignity of every person. Uh, and so, right, if we're, if we're going to take uh, access to health care as a basic human right, um, then obviously the, the goal of the Affordable Care Act to extend health care coverage uh, to as many people as possible is going to be seen as, as a clear pro. This is a clear benefit uh, of this plan. Uh, and so again, uh, in terms of you know what are the benefits, this was going to be uh, the most obvious and the most important uh, is this uh, extension of, of care to um, a broader range of people. Um, and it's interesting if, if you look at uh, what the bishops have to say uh, about uh, the particular details of the plan. One of the things that is, is criticized uh, is in fact um, that the Affordable Care Act doesn't go far enough in this regard. In addition to um, just a broader access to health care, 
Um, I would see uh, another positive or another pro of the Affordable Care Act um, being a, a move away from the current method, right? And that is um, we, we don't need to, we ought not to look at the Affordable Care Act kind of um, as, a, as a standalone entity, right? That it is a response to uh, the previous existing situation of health care uh, in, in America, right? Which, as I mentioned earlier, was, uh, it's always been the case that if somebody shows up at an emergency room uh, in a medical crisis, that they are legally entitled to treatment regardless of their ability to pay. Um, the problem with that approach uh, is probably obvious, right? On the one hand, of course, uh, it's a good thing that people are given uh, this emergency medical care regardless of their ability to pay for it. Um, but what that sets up is really kind of a worst of both worlds sort of situation, uh, right? In terms of just an economic approach, uh, this is very inefficient, right? That emergency room care is uh, basically the most expensive kind of care we can provide. Uh, we end up, people uh, only show up in the healthcare system when they are in an acute crisis, right? So these are going to be very expensive sorts of uh, problems to deal with, and they're taking place in the most expensive uh, dispensary of healthcare that we really have available. So really what you end up creating is a situation where healthcare uh, in that model is as expensive as possible uh, because we only get them when there's an actual crisis going on and uh, it's in the most expensive venue that we have. Um, it's also kind of a worst case scenario in terms of the results it generates, right? In terms of the actual health that follows from the treatment, right? Because you don't need to have any sort of expertise in medical research to know um, that basically every medical study agrees that preventative care is much more effective uh, than emergency or crisis care, right? Uh, and this is a cliche, but it's also a scientific fact um, that it is much more effective to provide regular preventative care to people uh, and that they are much healthier if you manage chronic conditions uh, as opposed to uh, having people not receive health care to the point where it reaches a crisis, right? It is uh, much worse for a person to have their diabetes, for example, not monitored, not controlled, uh, so they go through a long period of poor health, uh, and then there is some crisis that finally arrives, uh, and they show up in an emergency room, right? It is not only more cost-effective uh, to treat them regularly in a preventative way, but they lead much better lives uh, in that uh, time leading up to what would have been a crisis if their condition is treated regularly. Um, so given that that was the situation that came before, uh, there are just a handful of different options that were available, right? We could have kept that system, right, which seems to be a worst of both worlds scenario. It's expensive and ineffective. Uh, well, what are our other options if we wanted to move away from that? Well, one option would be to just let people die in the streets. Um, and while um, some people, if you kind of pick apart what they're saying in some of their statements about healthcare, seem to implicitly um, have that idea in the back of their minds, uh, no one is really aware of in a serious way publicly advocating that we simply let people die in the streets rather than provide healthcare to them. Um, so, assuming we're not gonna let that happen, um, then we can either stick with that old model or we can figure out a way to provide um, broader preventative care to as many people as possible. Um, and so, uh, to the extent that the Affordable Care Act is a real effort to do that, I think we can see it as a positive, both in terms of uh, being a more effective way of spending money on preventative care rather than crises, and also in terms of having a much greater likelihood of generating real health as a result of treatment. And again, uh, not to hammer this point too much, but uh, it's, before we move on to the cons, since we're already talking about the, the previous methods, uh, we should recognize that um, all of us in one way or another were paying for health care for the uninsured in one way or another before the Affordable Care Act, right? That when people showed up at the emergency room in a crisis without insurance, someone had to pay for that treatment, right? And so what happens, of course, is that treatment 
uh, gets absorbed by the hospital or by the doctors, uh, but they can't absorb that all themselves. So what do they do? Well, they pass those costs along to the insured patients and to the insurance companies and to the government, right? So that we were paying for those treatments in our taxes, in our insurance premiums, in our co-pays and deductibles uh, before the Affordable Care Act ever came along. So it's not the case that uh, prior to this, uh, we weren't paying for the health care of the uninsured. Uh, one could argue we were just paying for worse health care that was more expensive. Uh, and so at least the goal of the Affordable Care Act is to provide better health care uh, that's less expensive. Uh, and we have already been paying for it all along, so we might as well get more bang for our buck. Now then, what are the cons of the Affordable Care Act? Well, here I want to come at this specifically from uh, a Catholic perspective. So I don't want to necessarily get into the politics or the bureaucracy. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. But from a Catholic perspective, when we're talking about the cons of uh, the Affordable Care Act, of course, the major thing that is going to come up uh, is uh, the uh, coverage uh, for abortion and contraceptive services, right? And this is where uh, much of the debate in the Catholic world has been taking place uh, in regard to the Affordable Care Act. Um, and of course, if you look at what the bishops have said about this, this is something that they have spoken out regarding this uh, very forcefully and repeatedly uh, over the past few years. Uh, and so, again, you can take a look at some of the documents I'll put on Blackboard uh, for you uh, to get a, a kind of direct sense of what it is that the bishops are saying. But at the end of the day, um, the question that I would want to focus on here is um, what are we to make of this as, as Catholics, as people attempting to follow Catholic ethics, Catholic social teaching? Um, given the pros of uh, extending health care to as many people as possible, are the cons of uh, the coverage for these immoral services, is it sufficient to reach the conclusion that we ought not to support the Affordable Care Act, uh, that we ought to, uh, as vigorously as possible, oppose it. Um, that seems to be one of the real debates going on in the Catholic uh, world today. Right? And so how do we work through this, this attempt to balance um, the support for abortion and contraception with the benefits of a broader provision of health care to the poor uh, and the marginalized? Um, and so again, what I would fall back on is uh, a set of principles that we have talked about many times uh, in our ethics courses, right? It would be uh, double effect and, and principle of legitimate cooperation. Um, so if I'm thinking about this as a taxpayer and as a voter, um, how ought I to work through this? Well, uh, in regards to double effect, um, I think we could say that as an individual taxpayer, as an individual buying insurance, um, the, the uh, unwanted effect of supporting uh, abortion or contraception uh, is in fact uh, for most Catholics an unintended consequence, right? That it is not something um, that we are actively seeking. Uh, it is an unintended consequence of supporting uh, the provision of our own health care and health care for others. Uh, and so really to kind of cut to the chase, I think um, double effect would not really uh, oppose operating within uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, except when we get to that final criterion of looking at the proportions of benefits uh, versus costs, or uh, the proportion of uh, the good effect versus the bad effect. Um, and that's really where uh, sort of a major question lies. Uh, is the benefit of this broad range of access to health care sufficiently great to uh, outweigh the negative of, of an increase in support for uh, abortion and, and contraceptive services. Uh, and on that front, again, this is going to be something that people debate, uh, and I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. Um, from my perspective, uh, it seems um, that we could at least make a reasonable case uh, that the Affordable Care Act uh, even as it currently exists, would could pass this criterion, right? That the the increase in access to health care uh, is fairly significant, um, and it does seem to in fact be increasing in a significant way the number of people who have health insurance and therefore have access to regular preventative health care. Um, does it 
probably also increase funding for uh, abortion and contraceptive services. Uh, it may, right? And frankly, the data, uh, I have not seen really conclusive data in that regard so far. Uh, and there, of course, have been um, some legal cases limiting, uh, at least for some corporations, the requirement to provide that sort of funding. So I think we could make a legitimate case that uh, the benefits are sufficiently great. Um, for me, really, the key, uh, key question here is how does this uh, support for participation in the Affordable Care Act uh, fit when we look at the principle of legitimate cooperation? Um, it seems really to be the most relevant uh, sort of uh, reasoning process for this issue. Uh, and so again, we could work through it uh, and, and try to figure that out. Again, to cut to the chase, um, I think it's safe to say that for faithful Catholics, it's not going to be formal cooperation, right? We are not uh, explicitly endorsing or approving of uh, the extension of, of abortion or contraceptive services. Um, so then it's a question of, does our involvement in the system constitute material support or material cooperation? And if so, which it does at least to some extent, um, how immediate is that cooperation? Right? Are we talking about immediate cooperation? Are we talking about immediate uh, cooperation or remote cooperation? And I think this is really where uh, the debate would lie. Um, how directly uh, is uh, contraceptive or abortion services, how directly are those services being supported by uh, the insurance premiums of individual Catholics or the uh, tax funding of individual uh, Catholic taxpayers. Um, and to that extent, um, again, I'm not sure. Unfortunately, there's no formula that we can go to the Vatican website and, and plug in and get an, an answer. Um, but it at least seems um, feasible to me that this would constitute um, fairly remote material cooperation. Uh, so if I am paying my insurance premium uh, through my employer to Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, and Blue Cross is covering uh, contraceptive prescriptions or uh, even uh, elective abortions um, to different policyholders, um, my involvement in that I think one could argue it is fairly remote in a way similar to the fact that my taxes are used by the government uh, to provide um, any number of services or to perform any number of actions that would be morally objectionable from a Catholic perspective. Um, this is not something I am directly involved in. It's not something I would choose to do. Uh, it is sadly a part of being uh, one small member of these large systems, whether it's the American health insurance system or uh, the U.S. government. And now again, other people would debate and would argue that it is a more uh, immediate type of um, support. Uh, and so I can see, for example, if, if you are in fact the owner of a corporation uh, who's being asked to fund your employee's um, insurance and that is uh, then being used for these services, that would seem to be uh, more immediate. Uh, and that's really kind of the logic behind, say, the Hobby Lobby case uh, or the Little Sisters of the Poor. And there seems to be at least hope for legal remedies on that front. Uh, but for the individual policyholder or taxpayer, um, it seems at least plausible to me we could argue this is remote cooperation. Uh, now, even if we accept that, right, it's important to note that uh, remote cooperation does not mean this is a free pass, go ahead and pass go and collect $200. Um, if we are remotely cooperating in some sort of an evil, um, this does not mean, okay, no, no qualms, go ahead. Uh, it means, given that there are no other options available, uh, it is not immoral for us to be part of the health insurance system. Um, however, we still have an obligation to the extent that we are able to work for change and to oppose the evils, right? So I can, uh, I would argue, through the principle of legitimate cooperation, continue to purchase insurance to provide necessary health care for my family um, under the Affordable Care Act system. However, at the same time, I ought to be petitioning uh, government officials, should be petitioning uh, the insurance companies uh, for ways to minimize and or eliminate my involvement in that evil uh, so that uh, 
we ought to continue uh, opposing that as much as we're able. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, I think if you look at what the U.S. Catholic bishops are doing, uh, it follows this uh, more or less precisely, uh, that the bishops have not called for the complete and total repeal of uh, the Affordable Care Act um, because of some of the benefits we talked about earlier, but they have consistently and vigorously uh, fought for a minimization, if not an elimination, of uh, involvement in these immoral practices. Uh, and so that clearly is a con, um, but I think it is a, uh, one could argue that it's a remote cooperation uh, and that we can still uh, be morally free uh, of sort of direct guilt uh, or responsibility as remote material cooperation, as long as we are also working to minimize that cooperation as much as possible. Having looked at the pros and cons now, uh, we still have uh, a number of topics that we haven't really touched on that are hotly contested and debated in the culture and in, in Catholic circles as well, right? And that is uh, not so much the question of should we be expanding healthcare coverage uh, or these questions of, of the uh, involvement in immoral practices. It has more to do with the nuts and bolts of how the Affordable Care Act works. Uh, and obviously there are many people who oppose the Affordable Care Act uh, in those terms, right, in terms of inefficiency and bureaucracy uh, and government interference uh, and free enterprise and individual lives, right? And this is a, a whole other area of debate. Now, uh, Frankly, from a Catholic social teaching perspective, there are certainly issues to be concerned about here, right? And in particular, there's uh, the issue of subsidiarity. Uh, that is um, requiring uh, healthcare coverage on this sort of national level and setting up a national program uh, does raise concerns about subsidiarity. Um, it does raise concerns about participation and the ability of, of individuals to really have a voice uh, in the system. Uh, and so I think that is a real concern, right? And I don't think anyone is under any of illusions that government bureaucracy is the best way to do things. Uh, on the flip side, uh, there are real concerns, I think, about um, solidarity. Uh, and that, uh, again, if we look at the system that came before, for those who had employee-sponsored health care plans, uh, it worked pretty well. Uh, of course, everybody complained about health insurance. Um, but it seemed to provide fairly adequate care for people. Um, of course, the problem is that it did not really do that for those uh, who were outside of the workforce or who were on the margins of economic and social life. And so really, I think that's where the issue of solidarity comes in, that uh, if we are really going to have a system, a program that reaches everyone, including those uh, very unlike ourselves in different ways, uh, which is what solidarity is all about, then it is going to require uh, a much broader, a much more universal or national um, program to ensure that everyone can be covered, including, for example, migrant workers who are going to move from state to state and who don't have regular employment. Uh, we need to have a method in our society for providing health care fo for those sorts of people, for those marginalized. And again, um, to just compare it uh, to what came before, if we're going to use Catholic social teaching principles like the preferential option for the poor, despite the bureaucratic problems of a national health care system, um, it does seem to better reflect uh, Catholic social teaching principles than what came before. Uh, because if we're thinking about the preferential option for the poor, um, how we're gauging a policy should be uh, primarily or first of all in terms of what it does for the poor and the marginalized and the outcasts. Having a healthcare system that is centered on uh, employer-provided health plans, it should be obviously problematic to anyone who looks at it, right? That um, the impoverished, the marginalized, the outcasts are precisely those who don't have regular full-time employment, right? So the fact that our healthcare system, uh, as it came before the Affordable Care Act, was really centered on uh, employer provided health plans, uh, that in and of itself should strike us as deeply problematic. Now yes, there were, there are systems like Medicare and Medicaid uh, 
uh, to deal with the unemployed. Um, and really what the Affordable Care Act uh, does is to sort of shift the balance and to try to expand uh, the coverage provided by Medicaid and Medicare and programs like that to be a bigger part of, of the system and to integrate employer-provided health plans into that broader system. Um, so again, this is gonna entail bureaucracy, right? It can't be run by individual employers. Um, but uh, if we are really going to provide health care to those who don't have regular full-time employment, there has to be some way of, of reaching them, uh, which really seems to require uh, a government involvement, right? It is the government that reaches all of those people. Uh, it can't be employers because many of these people are not employed for any number of reasons. Uh, so again, uh, I have, don't have the time uh, or the expertise to really weigh in on the efficiencies uh, of the Affordable Care Act. But I would think, uh, at the very least, uh, it seems to be sort of a wash from the perspective of Catholic social teaching in that, yes, it does run contrary to subsidiarity in various ways, but it also does seem uh, to uh, support the idea of solidarity and a preferential option for the poor uh, by offering coverage on a sort of national scale that is going to reach more of those, uh, those kinds of people. So that's really uh, sort of some ways that I would think about the Affordable Care Act through the lens of Catholic social teaching. Um, and at the end of the day, as you might guess, uh, the position I would take uh, would be in many ways uh, essentially the position advocated by uh, the U.S. Catholic bishops. That is uh, affirming the general goals uh, of the Affordable Care Act of extending health care coverage uh, to as many people as possible, especially those uh, who don't have access to uh, employer plans because they are unemployed for any number of reasons. Um, so that, that broad agreement with that objective, um, some uncertainty about uh, the pragmatic uh, best means to achieve that. Uh, no doubt there are many inefficiencies and bureaucracies going on, um, but at the same time, uh, there are going to have to be some costs to reach um, everyone uh, that needs health care in, in such a large, mobile nation. Uh, but uh, also recognizing that even though we might affirm the overall goals, that we do need to work as vigorously as we can to uh, eliminate or minimize uh, the participation in uh, immoral practices such as uh, abortion services or providing uh, widespread distribution of contraceptive services. Uh, and so at the end of the day, um, I think a faithful Catholic can reasonably conclude that they uh, can be part of the system, the healthcare system, and to support those those goals of broader coverage because it does really produce real benefits that respect the dignity of all people. Uh, but we also need to continue to work to minimize our involvement uh, in these immoral practices that are sadly part of the healthcare system. Um, so uh, again, that's just my initial take on it using some of the principles we've been going over the past few weeks. Uh, I would be interested in hearing uh, you all's thoughts on this uh, on Blackboard. Um, and again, I will also give you some of the documents put out by the USCCB for you to look over yourselves uh, and comment on as well.